Hey everybody, it's Emily the Crazy Worm Lady. I'm here today to start a brand new series on worm bin basics. So I'm going to make a focus on starting bins with cocoons because that's my new venture. I've been breeding worms and I'm starting to sell some cocoons as a little side business. And I want to show you guys a little bit about how I feel it's the best way to um, run a worm bin and how you can be successful in hatching cocoons. Um, cocoons are a bit different than worms simply in the fact that cocoons are going to take a little while to hatch and of course the worms will take longer to grow but the benefit to starting with cocoons over starting with worms is that they're very cheap to ship and um, you know each cocoon is going to yield you several worms depending on the species it could yield you as little as one but up to as many as five worms per cocoon so the, the nice thing about that is you may end up from your thousand cocoons getting as many as 5,000 worms. So it, it's pretty incredible what the possibilities are. So for me, um, you can get more for your money and I just think it's a really fun way to make sure that you have all of your basics, your, um, your moisture, your pH buffer, your bedding, everything perfect. Because if it's perfect for the cocoons and they hatch, you're not gonna have any problem raising worms. So today we're gonna get started um, setting up a bin and in preparation for the cocoons or for your worms to arrive, because either way, it's gonna be the same thing. So some of you have already purchased cocoons for me and I want to have this series kind of running alongside as you guys are starting and we can address questions along the way. But today we're gonna set up a bin and we're gonna add the bedding and get ready for the cocoons to arrive. So let's hop down, set this bin up, and we will get started. Okay guys, so I wanted to start the way most uh, DIYers get started with the worm bin, and so I did purchase a bin for this series. However, um, pretty much all the bins I have now, I have so many of them, I repurpose bins, there's no reason to continue to buy them. And if you might have a bin sitting around your house, that's even better. Um, if you have an old tote that you had things stored in, um, if you just have some sort of uh, shallow tray, uh, like a mortar mixing tray, I've used those before, you really don't need more than six to eight inches for really any of your worms to live in. So it could be rather shallow and it does not have to have a lid. You can always put a cover across the top of your bin, uh, like a loose sheet of bubble wrap or landscape fabric. There's so many different options and you don't have to buy something if you think you have something that may work at home. A lot of people use five gallon buckets. So there's, there's many options, but I chose this Husky bin. I've used these before um, because they nest, the lids nest very snugly and they have clasps on either end. So these clasps on either end, if I can get this lid back down, because it's nice and snug, um, it shuts quite tight and that can prevent the worms from climbing out if they get a little, um, I call it flighty, but if they start to climb on you, sometimes due to barometric pressure or something wrong in the bin, the worms will climb. And of course, nobody wants the worms getting out of the bin. So what I do is I get these bins that fit real snugly together, and then I start to think about aeration. So the important thing about aeration is worms breathe through their skin, so they need to have not only water to stay moist, but they need to have lots of air. So since these bins, the lids fit very snugly on them, there's not going to be a lot of air getting in here. So um, most people, like myself, drill holes in their bins. Um, I've drilled holes around the inside rims, around the top. I usually drill holes in my lid. But some people also choose to drill holes in the bottom of their bin and put some sort of catch tray beneath this top bin, um, or they'll nest a bin like this inside of another one with something to hold the bottom tray up a little bit to allow any sort of drainage to seep down. I personally discourage this. First of all, I think if you're running a bin in a healthy fashion, you shouldn't be getting drainage. Um, some people do choose to use that liquid that drains down to fertilize their plants. However, sometimes that could be kind of an, an anaerobic type liquid and could carry bacteria. So it's not always the best. And also, if you have holes in the bottom, 
A lot of times your worms will go exploring, they'll end up down in your bottom tray with the liquid and they could potentially die, you know, drown. So I encourage you to try to learn to run your bin in the very, very best way possible. And the best way to do that, in my opinion, is to keep the holes out of the bottom, keep it just the way it is, but provide plenty of aeration in other places. So I'm going to drill a whole bunch of holes into the lid of this bin. And it doesn't have to be anything fancy. I usually use a, either a quarter or a three quarter inch drill bit um, just to make sure that I get plenty of aeration. I drill them all through the top and that should provide plenty of air. So let me do that. I will show you what I use. And then we'll start adding our bedding to this bin and preparing for the cocoons or the worms to arrive. I didn't want to have the very loud noise that I knew this would make. So I did take the liberty to already drill holes in this bin. Um, I believe this is a three quarter inch drill bit, but don't take my word on that. But my goal was to provide as much aeration as possible. The beauty of this is if you find your bin starts to run a bit wet, you can always drill more holes in the top or you could choose to drill holes around the upper rims of the sides. You have options. So, you know, you can always add more. Some people will cut a hole, you know, square out of the top of their bin and um, tape or glue some mesh screening across it to allow even more aeration. So there's really no right or wrong way to do it. Just make sure that you have some sort of aeration to your bin. The next thing I wanna do is I'm gonna to need to go and clear out all of the loose pieces of plastic from when I drill those holes because they will not compost so we don't want them in our bin. Okay, so pro tip, if you're trying to get out those pieces of plastic from the bottom, for some reason these bins seem to have some sort of static electricity and they stick and they don't want to come out, use a damp cloth. You can wipe them out easier that way. But honestly, if any, you know, little pieces hang around and you miss them, it's fine. You can just get them out of your compost later, but always want to try to avoid it because it's just extra work that nobody really wants to do. So... The next thing you want to talk about is some bedding and you have a lot of choices when it comes to bedding. I always encourage you to use what you have around. So for me, I've got a ton of cardboard. I like to order a lot of things online. So for me, cardboard is a really easy bedding source to use. If you're starting with cocoons, I like starting the bottom with larger pieces because the babies like to climb into the flutes of the cardboard because the, there's like a cornstarch glue and the worms seem to go crazy for it. Uh, if you're starting with worms, you don't have to. However, it's not going to hurt anything and it will add a lot of ability to um, absorb a lot of moisture if your bin would get too wet. So I don't think you can really go wrong with cardboard. Another option you have is newspaper. Um, I kind of use a, a combination of shredded cardboard and shredded newspaper for most of my bedding. Uh, I have a cross cut shredder. I believe it's actually a micro cut shredder that I use. It's on its last legs. So it's not doing the best job anymore, but you just make do with what you have. You can also use things like egg crates. Some people, if they use a lot of coconut core or peat moss for starting seeds, things like that, they will also add that. Um, but a lot of people have some concerns about sustainability with peat moss and coconut core. So it's all about what you have around and how you feel about um, the environment. If you want to purchase things like that, I use peat moss just because I breed worms. So for me, I have peat moss already and I want to make sure it goes to the best use. So I am going to also add a little bit of peat moss. This is going to be the only real bedding that I add to this bin. However, if you, um, have worm bins already, another great thing to add is just a little bit of finished compost. The whole reason you want to set a bin up before the worms and the cocoons or whatever it may be arrive is you want to have a bedding that's somewhat living. And by living bedding, I mean it has built up some sort of microbial life because the worms um, and the bacteria and microbes, they all work together to compost the fastest. And you want to make sure that there's a suitable environment for your worms or for your cocoons to hatch. So um, if, I mean, I have that, but I want to kind of do this 
assuming that you've never started a worm bin, and in that case, you don't have to add any of that. It's just a nice jump start for your system. But in replacement of that, I always put a little bit of food or something that could, could grow some bacteria, mold, things like that, because small amounts of that prior to your cocoons or your worms arriving are definitely gonna help your system. So I've got used coffee grounds. Used coffee grounds grow a lot of mold really fast. So I'm honestly only gonna add two little sprinkles because the last thing I want is to have a crazy mold bloom because if you have a mold bloom, then you can attract fungus gnats, um, fruit flies, and since this bin doesn't have anything uh, in it to process the bacteria and the mold, you want to go easy on it. So I just added a few sprinkles of that. The next thing I want to talk about is grit or um, some sort of pH buffer combination of things to your bin. Now, grit or pH buffer, they're usually the same thing simply because they tend to be um, calcium based and they tend to work that way. Um, I make my own personal dry mix. Again, this boils down to what do you have around? Do you want to buy anything for your worm bins? So it's a per uh, completely personal choice. Um, but worms have a gizzard and the gizzard needs to have something, you know, sharp and almost like fibrous, like we need fiber to digest. They need something to pulverize the food so that as it moves down their intestinal tract, it doesn't ferment. If it ferments going down their intestinal tract, they can get something called protein poisoning or string of pearls where they literally bloat up with gas and pinch off into little pieces that look like a string of pearls and it does kill the worm. So I always am overly generous with grit or pH buffer, but I kind of use a mix of things. So oysters, crushed, crushed oyster shell or crushed eggshell tend to be the go-to for most people. Um, I use crushed oyster shell for the most part. I do use eggshell, but I don't have enough for all of the bins that I run. So I do purchase crushed oyster shell. Uh, in this mix, I also have diatomaceous earth. Diatomaceous earth works well for bug control um, if it's dry. In a worm bin, it doesn't work much for bug control unless you put it like on a top layer that uh, is gonna stay relatively dry. It does, however, have a lot of trace minerals and it also um, is a grit source for your worms. It feels super powdery if you um, run it through your fingers, but it actually is sharp enough that in the, the gut of the worm, it works as a grit source along with the oyster shell or egg shell. You can also use sand or garden lime. There's a lot of different options for grit sources. But I also like the oyster shell because it adds some calcium. Calcium is important um, for a pH buffer and um, supposedly it's important for cocoon production. So you can't go wrong with that. I also in here have some kelp meal. I use it for my plants so I have it around. It's just a good source of trace minerals and um, it also has good water retention properties. And I also have a little bit of alfalfa meal and a little bit of neem cake. Again, don't use these things if you don't want to. If you don't have them around, don't feel obligated to buy them. All you really need is bedding, moisture, and grit. That's really all you need. So <clears throat> the neem cake that I use is for bug control. Neem cake can actually paralyze the swallowing mechanism of insects that could potentially get into your bin. And um, it, it works very, very well. I actually stopped using it recently in some of my bins, and I've had a little bit of an outbreak of green beetles. I think it's because I've been feeding a lot of rice to my worms. But without the neem cake, the populations have gone up quite substantially. The alfalfa meal, again, is a trace mineral. Um, but the best thing about alfalfa meal for me is that it does heat up just a little bit during decomposition. And especially for cocoons like African night crawlers that prefer a warmer environment, um, I think it gives you a better chance of having a really good hatch rate. But um, things like coffee, like I'm using there, also heat up a little bit. Keeping your bin by a sunny window, even though it has the lid on, it's going to absorb some of that heat, um, may also help. But I don't think it's entirely necessary. But again, trying to look for the best possible scenario for getting our bins started off well and getting a good hatch rate. The final thing I need to add here is some water. So I'm going to get some water in here, mix it well, and make sure I have no standing liquid in the bottom. 
And then I might add a tiny piece of food down in this corner, buried up really well, again, to help the microbes get to work before anything gets introduced to the bin. Okay, so I'm gonna take this little piece of a banana peel. I only, it's like really a quarter of a peel. I t you know, tore it up a little bit. I'll probably tear it a little bit more because it will decompose faster if there's more surface area. So the more you can kind of tear it up, the better. Um, but I like to choose sugary foods to add first because um, the microbes love sugar and it'll definitely get the bacterial growth going a little bit faster. So I'm just gonna dig down in this corner. I'm gonna add these two pieces and I'm gonna make sure it's well covered. I'll even mound up the bedding a little bit more over here. Um, and then I'm just gonna add some water. So I have a container of water and I'm just going to pour a little bit at a time. So it's not even half of my two and a half quart container here because I want to mix everything up and give it a little while to absorb so that I don't over moisten the system. So what you always wanna check is down the bottom do you end up with standing liquid? And it doesn't look like there's standing liquid, but this bedding still is rather dry. So what I usually do is I'll sit, let it sit for a few minutes in between checks. I'll keep adding water until I feel like the moisture is like a wrung out sponge. When you squeeze a little bit of the bedding, a few drops will come out, but no more than that. And there's no standing liquid in the bottom. And that way you know everything is perfect. Um, the final thing that I will do, I'm not going to do all of the moistening on camera. There's no reason for that. This video is going to be a little lengthy anyway. But I like to put some sort of cover across the surface. Even though I have a lid on it, um, there is still the potential for things like fruit flies to be attracted. Especially, like I said, when we don't have worms or cocoons or anything in here that are going to be actively feeding on it. It doesn't have to be, you know, perfectly to every edge. But I'm just going to use some newspaper I have here and just create a little bit of a cover for this. Also, if you would start to see any sort of bugs coming into your bin, you could sprinkle a little bit of diatomaceous earth on top of this dry bedding at the surface, this dry cover. And um, that way, if any of them make it up to the top and crawl across the surface, they'll hit that diatomaceous earth and it will um, dry them out and it, it will kill them. Um, just another side note, if you do feel concerned about bugs, even though those holes in your lids that are drilled are not very large, there's always a chance for the fruit flies to find their way in. And the last thing anybody wants is a bug problem in their bin. I will link a few videos um, and articles below on handling bugs and managing a worm bin, but um, you can always tape or glue some screen even over top of those little holes in the lid. I personally don't feel the need to do that. I have had um, outbreaks of various pests over the years, but um, I usually feel like I'm able to handle it without having to go to that measure. But of course, it's all a personal thing. If you guys haven't figured out, it's all about what you have available, what your personal preference is, and in my opinion, there's no real right or wrong way to do it, but I just wanted to give you my opinion on the matter and how I think you will be most successful. Use a little bit of what you have around, make sure there's something that's gonna help create a living bedding so that the um, cocoons or the worms will have a good environment to hatch in and you're good to go. So the last thing I'm gonna do is I'm just gonna pop this lid on this bin. I will come back and make sure the moisture is just right. Um, but I just pop the lid on this bin and let it sit until my worms or cocoons arrive. I wanna thank you guys for sticking around. I know it was a long video today, but I wanna set you up for success. Um, some of you may be new to my channel. I'm sure many of you are my longtime subscribers and I thank you all for doing so, but um, I think this series will be really helpful for new people, um, but even some of us who have been composting for years, I definitely think there's always a good reminder to go through kind of all the steps slowly and kind of think about what we're doing so we can troubleshoot our own problems and make sure that the worm castings that we can create are the healthiest for our gardens and our soil. Um, 
one little note I forgot to mention is about the size of your bin. Um, in my opinion, size of the bin doesn't matter a whole lot. Once your worms start growing their population or your cocoons start to hatch, um, you can always go up to a larger bin, but um, the surface area is most important, not the depth of your bin. So surface area, um, the, the rule of thumb is that one square foot of surface area is good for about a pound or 1,000 worms, roughly. So kind of keep that in mind if you are expecting a thousand cocoons and you think, gosh, I could get up to three pounds of worms, you might wanna start with a slightly larger bin because you know they're gonna need space to grow. But you can always upgrade later. It's kind of a, a nice hobby. It's nice that you can do a kind of DIY for cheap and you can always adapt as things change in your system. So let me know what you think, guys. Drop those comments below. Like this video, subscribe if you'd like some more content from me and I can't wait to come back next week for another update. Hope you have a great day.